Um, my name is Ellen Holstey. I'm Community Program Manager at Pierce Cedar Creek Institute. And thank you guys for joining us this Friday for our virtual coffee talk. Uh, you do not have to have coffee, but I do have my, my nice <laughs> uh, Pierce Cedar Creek mug this morning. Um, so this is a new format for us today. Um, so today we're doing this because it is Endangered Species Day. Uh, and here in Michigan, we have I think I figured out about over 300 animals that are endangered, threatened, or of special concern, and more than 400 plant species. So it's something that we need to be concerned about here in Michigan. And Jen is going to talk about uh, one of those today. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, <laughs> it's good to see you all. <laughs> I recognize some familiar faces out there. Um, my name is Jen Moore. I'm an associate professor in the biology department at Grand Valley State University. Um, I've been working down at Pierce Cedar Creek for many, many years now. Well, it seems like many years. I don't know. Maybe in the grand scheme of things, it's not that many. But um, I am a conservation biologist, and I focus a lot of my research on reptiles. So we are fortunate in Michigan to have um, some very unique uh, and interesting threatened reptiles. So I work with our turtles and I work with our Massasauga rattlesnakes. Um, and then of course today we're gonna focus on one of the turtles that the Institute is lucky to have um, and those are Eastern box turtles. So I also wanted to introduce, I have Faith Kuzma here who you'll see somewhere in your tiles, I hope. Um, <laughs> Faith is a natural resource management major at Grand Valley State in the biology department and she's been working with the Institute's box turtles now for a year and she's coming back for another summer uh, this year. So Faith is going to be able to answer questions and hopefully talk a little bit about her experience um, working with the box turtles at the Institute. So. Hi. <laughs> Thanks Faith. Um, so I'm going to just give you all, let's see, I want to give you a brief sort of overview of um, turtles and, and box turtles in particular. I'm going to try and keep it kind of light. Um, just so, show you some pictures of turtles and um, just give you a little bit of food for thought. So um, I think we'll um, save your questions or put them in the chat box while I'm talking. I, this probably, I won't be talking for too long. Um, and then we can address those afterwards. So um, I'm gonna attempt to share my screen now. So I did put up my email address up there just in case anybody you know has some just Dying, there's some question they forgot to ask and they're just dying to learn about when we're done with all of this. So if you want to send me an email, you can also follow me on Twitter. So there's my Twitter handle. It's, doc, it's at Dr. Reptilia. Um, okay. So I know this is the worst, right? I'm starting out with relationships of turtles. So I wanted to put our, our box turtles in some context, right? So in um, biology, when we're, we're talking about relationships between species and groups of animals, we use these trees. Right? And so all this is, is it's just a tree that shows the relationships between different groups of turtles. So a couple of things I want to point out. So these are all the different groups of turtles. Can you guys see my mouse? Okay, so if I point out things with my mouse, you'll see them. Okay. Okay, so just to, just to start. So this is all the turtles in their different groups. So we group them into to, um, families, and then we group them in even bigger groups than that. So anyway, these are just all the turtle groups. And their closest relative are the archosaurs. So there's crocodiles in here and there's birds in here, right? So there's some debate about the relationships between these groups, but generally speaking, there's two big groups of turtles, the pleurodeers and the cryptodeers. Ooh, you're thinking, what in the heck are those? This is a group that we're not super familiar with in Michigan. We don't have any of these. These are called the side-necked turtles. Here's an example of a side-necked turtle. So this is a weird way to group turtles, but we group them based on how they're able to pull their necks back into their shells. The side neck turtles, they don't do it like a turtleneck. They lay their, they're only able to lay their head over onto their shoulder. So they're called the side necks versus the crypto deers, which are the hidden neck turtles. Those are the ones that we're most familiar with. They can pull their heads back into their shells like a turtleneck, like you're putting on a little turtleneck. So those are the ones that we're familiar with. And of course, this is a box turtle. So that's the, this big group right here. Okay, so the box turtles fall in a large group of turtles called the amidids, which is right here. Um, they're, the, they're called the pond turtles. 
But box turtles, as probably most of you know, don't live in ponds, right? And in fact, I have people ask me all the time what the difference between box turtles and tortoises are because box turtles kind of look like little tortoises. Um, and there's not a lot of differences to be honest, but they're in different groups. So these are the tortoises here. And these are where our box turtles fall in with the amidids here. So they're in totally different groups of turtles. Okay, so anyway, there's some context for where they belong. I love this image. I think it's so cool. So this is what a turtle, this is a box turtle. This is what a box turtle looks like on the inside. It looks nothing like any other animal really. Uh, you know, turtles are characterized by this shell and the shell, all the shell really is, is if you took your ribs and you just flattened them all out and connected them, that would be a shell. So that's all they are. Connected to the vertebrae, as you can see up here, and flattened out to form this protective covering on top and then on bottom. It's really incredible. So they don't have any separation. There's no separation between the body cavity. It's just all one thing. So I saw someone said the other day, that turtles don't live inside their shell, they are their shell, right? <laughs> it's sort of their, um, their morphology. So there's a top part of the shell called the carapace and there's a bottom part of the shell called the plastron. That's kind of what it looks like. So you can see that the morphology of a box turtle is pretty interesting. They've got this really do domed shell right on the top, unlike a lot of our other pond turtles, but they still fall within this group. So they're really well adapted to life on land right? Oops, I skipped ahead. So we've got some really interesting box turtles in North America. This is just a smattering of some of them. Um, and these are neat, these desert box turtles with their green heads. Our Easterns, of course, characterized by kind of this yellow and black uh, pattern on the shell. Um, I would argue that these, our Easterns, are the most beautiful of the box turtle, North American box turtles, but someone might argue with me to the contrary, that maybe ornates are in there too. But anyway, Easterns are the ones that we have in Michigan. And this is kind of what they look like. I'm sure many of you have seen these before. Luckily in West Michigan, we're, we're lucky to have them. They're relatively, well, I don't know if they're, I don't want to say they're common, but um, they're much more common than they are on the east side of the state. Um, so this is about their size. If you look at the scale down at the bottom, that's about four inches. Um, Let's see. This is a terrible map, but I just wanted to show you that bo eastern box turtles in the orange here. Um, this is just a range map of different species and subspecies of box turtles. They are really broadly distributed. So they range all the way up here to north from northern Michigan all the way down into the tip of Florida. Um, so there's they've got a really broad distribution, but that doesn't mean that they're common within that distribution. So they're sort of patchily distributed within that distribution. And then interestingly, if you look at the distribution within Michigan, they really only occur uh, on the, up, up in northern Michigan on the west side of the state. And so if you think about why that might be, if anyone's thinking about what we tend to get more of on the west side of the state, um, we get more snow on the west side of the state, right? So the lake, my hypothesis is that the lake kind of provides a buffering effect for the climate on this side of the state. And if you're a turtle that spends its time down in the ground over winter, you actually need that snow as a insulating layer so that you don't freeze to death. And it turns out box turtles have, have a high tolerance for freezing anyway, but we can talk about that later if anyone has questions about that. So this, Faith, I think I got this idea from one of your slides at one point. I saw you put a picture up like this. So um, this, slide is just to illustrate some of the amazing diversity that we see in the shells of eastern box turtles. So eastern box turtles have a unique a pattern. Each individual has a pattern that's unique to that individual. So if you see a box turtle ever, like we, I'm lucky enough to have box turtles on my, at my house. They nest at my house, which is pretty cool. So we see these individuals periodically and I take pictures of them and I know who's who. So you can recognize an individual by its shell pattern. Um, and I wanna point out another thing that there's, there are some subtle differences that you can tell between males and females. And one of them is illustrated, if you look at this guy up here on the top left, you can see he's sort of got this flange back here and his shell kind of flares out at the back. 
that's a pretty good indication that that's a male. There's a couple of other things too that I'll point out in the next couple of pictures. The other thing I wanna note is if you look at this little guy down in the bottom left here, you can tell that this one's younger. And interestingly enough, in many species of turtles, you can age a turtle just by looking at its shell. So many of you are probably familiar with how you can age a tree, right? If you can count the growth rings, turtles are similar to that. So you can see that these little, we call them annuli. So they're, they're just like little rings on a tree. Um, if you guys can see, I'm pointing out there. You can count those. So they lay one of those down. They shed off these scutes, the outer layer of these. This is called a scute. Um, they shed these off every year. And so every year, when they do that, it lays down a line. So you can count these. So what happens then when they get older is this kind of gets worn down. Let's see if I can see a good example. Like this one up here, you can't really see those lines anymore. So after about 20 years or so, you can't count them anymore because um, they get too old. And remember these turtles, they live a long time. That's one of the things that's characteristic of turtles is they might live for 50, 60, 70, or 80, sometimes even 100 years. So they've seen a lot. All right, so just go, ah, ooh, ah, they're so beautiful. That's what I do on this slide. And their plastrons are, so the carapaces, that's a top shell again, and the plastrons are, are no different. There's just a ton of variation in terms of the, the patterning that you see from this dark black here to, um, you know, this almost sort of like, I don't even know what you would call that, but it's a lot more pattern than this one. <laughs> Um, so another thing I wanted to point out really quickly is when you're trying to tell the differences between males and females, if you flip the turtle over, males usually have, and you can tell on this top, these two right here would be most likely males. They have a little concave uh, part right there um, versus this one, which is a female. This one's a female. They're totally smooth and flat. Um, and that's because when they're mating, the male climbs up on the female's back and he sort of just sits there and that allows him to uh, fit on top of her a little bit better. So that's another way that you can tell the difference between a male and a female box turtle. Um, and then there's another way even. <laughs> so this one's not a tried and true way because there's a ton of variation, but generally speaking, the males and the female, the males and the females have different colored eyes. This is a, kind of an extreme example here. So um, this is a male up here on the left and his eyes are bright, bright red. Um, and then this is a female and her eyes are brown. So that's kind of a, a, another good clue. So it's relatively easy to tell the difference between male and female box turtles. Um, and then of course you can just appreciate their beauty. So these turtles, you know, like I said, they're, they're really highly adapted to life on land. They spend a lot of time in our, in our hardwood forests. Um, they like oak forests or oak dominated forests in particular. Um, and one of the cool things that I forgot to point out in the last slide is that they are able to completely, like unlike other turtles, they're able to completely close up inside their shells. So I'm going to flip back real quick. So if you notice right here on each one of their shells, they have this little hinge. This is not a feature that you see on most turtles. Um, this is an adaptation to life on land, and this allows them to completely enclose up into their shells. So if something like a fox is trying to eat them, or a raccoon, or whatever it might be, they can just close themselves up and stay in there as long as they need to, and uh, wait it out, essentially. So you can see that most of these have probably thought that I'm a predator, and they've closed themselves up. This one even grabbed a little bit of grass while it was doing it and it's stuck in its shell. And this is a tight, tight seal. So you're not gonna be able to stick your fingers in there and pull their legs out. Um, so that's a good thing. So that's a, a really neat um, adaptation that these turtles have that a lot of our other imitids, our other pond turtles don't have that. So that's pretty cool. Um, this is just to show a, an indication of the size differences between, I just put a lot of gratuitous, really cute turtle photos in here. So. We can all appreciate that, I think. <laughs> um, this is about, we rarely find this age class of turtle. This is about a two-year-old, um, and this is an adult. So you can see the difference in sizes there. Um, it's very hard to find box turtles, um, period. It's even harder to find the younger ones like this. Um, and I'll tell you some reasons why that may be the case. So this was a lucky day. We, we did a little happy dance after we found this little two-year-old. Okay, so I want to give you a little bit 
more um, about the biology of the turtle. So like every turtle, uh, box turtles lay eggs. Um, so around the beginning of June, most of the time, that's probably when a lot of you have seen turtles on roads. Um, that's when we, the females tend to be moving to their nesting areas. So if you're a box turtle, you um, need to find an open, uh, an opening in the canopy. That's gonna be an area that's warm enough to support the development of those eggs. So they're not gonna just lay their eggs in the forest. They have to go find, they like things like oak savannas and prairies that are nice and open. Uh, sometimes, like I think someone said in the comments that they have a soft shell that lays eggs in their yard. So sometimes turtles like yards and they also like bark chips and those like landscaping beds and that kind of stuff. It's easy to dig. Um, so anyway, they lay their eggs. Um, this is an image of one that's laying its eggs at night. There's a little egg there plopping out. Um, oddly enough, they'll let you sit right next to them with a red light on them. It doesn't, doesn't bother them while they're nesting. Um, so they dig the little nests with their back legs, plop their eggs in there, about average between eight and nine eggs maybe. Um, and then those develop over a few months. But the interesting thing about a lot of our turtles is that the temperature that the little eggs are incubating determines whether or not the babies are going to be males or females. So that's not the way it works for us, of course. It's not the way it works for mammals or lots of other species. But a lot of reptiles show what's called temperature-dependent sex determination. So for turtles, it's cool dudes and hot chicks. So at cool temperatures, you get boys. And at warm or hot temperatures, you get girls. So and that's, there's a very narrow range there that determines that um, temperature difference, which is kind of interesting. So those moms have to make good choices when they put their um, eggs out there. This is what the little babes look like. This one's just coming out of its egg. And you can see, see, like I said, lots of gratuitous baby turtle photos. Um, turtle eggs, if anyone has seen one before, you probably know this already. They're not like chicken eggs that are hard. Their eggshells are leathery. They're tough. And they actually kind of expand and grow as the baby grows inside. Um, so that's kind of interesting, but it's also hard, hard to get out of. So what they have is this little tiny thing right here. It's called an egg tooth. And what it does is it lets them kind of slice that egg open and then they can climb out. And that egg tooth falls off within about a week after they come out. So if you find a baby turtle, look for its egg tooth. And if that little white thing is still there, that means it just hatched out. So this one just hatched, obviously. It's coming out of its egg. This is what they look like when they come out. This one actually still has his little egg tooth there. Um, they're tiny and adorable, um, and they're pretty helpless, and lots of things like to eat them. Um, again, more gratuitous box turtle photos. So they're really tiny when they come out. You can see how big they are compared to a quarter. Um, but it's really, really fun when these guys got to, when these guys come out, we, we, uh, we were lucky enough to have some out last year at the Institute. So I'll let Faith talk a little bit about that. Okay, so where it's Endangered Species Day, why are we talking about turtles? Well, turtles are, are, turtles are having problems all over the globe. They're declining for various reasons. Um, and, and our turtles in Michigan are no exception. So the biggest thing that started this, lots of these declines for most, most endangered species is um, just loss of habitat. So we have a lot of turtles that rely on wetlands in Michigan. A lot of those wetlands have been converted to things like agriculture. That's why I have this corn field down here in the corner. But now what we're dealing with is things like uh, road mortality. So turtles and roads don't mix very well. Um, and so that, especially for adults, which is these populations require their adults to have high survival. And so when they're getting killed on roads, that's not good. And then the other thing that happens really commonly is these things like raccoons um, dig up the nests and eat the, eat the babies. So um, we, we have an abundance of what we call meso predators, like these raccoons now, more so than we ever did before. And so they're really hitting these nests hard. So if you ever see a nest that looks like this, this isn't what a nest looks like when the babies hatch. This is what it looks like when something eats all the babies. So if you ever see eggs chewed up like this, um, it's not because they hatched out, it's because something ate them. When they hatch out, you don't know it. <laughs> they just climb out of a little hole. Um, so I'm, I'm interested in conservation of turtles across the board because they're dealing with some things that, we, um, that they can't deal with 
with on their own. So there's lots of stuff that we can do to try and help them out. So this is, um, these are some pictures from, this is commonly what we do with animals when we want to learn things about them and we want to try and conserve them. We'll stick radio transmitters on them. So that's these little things. And this is what Faith was able to do last summer. So this is a little device that allows us to track the, the, the animals. We use, see it's got a little antenna here. We use an antenna, it puts off a radio frequency and then we can find them. So what we wanted to do was learn how the, the Institute's turtles were using the property and then also try and find some of those nests so we could save them from being eaten by raccoons. Um, this is what they looked like just a couple weeks ago when they were waking up, coming out of their overwintering burrows right here. So they, this female right here spent the whole winter down in this little hole and this one over here too. Um, so I don't know, Faith, I don't know if you want to um, just kind of informally talk about what you guys did last summer really quickly, if that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I have a couple of pictures too. Oh, good. Perfect. Up there. Okay. Um, let me stop sharing then and you can share your screen. Does sure. that work? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Okay. All right. Can you see that? I cannot. No? No. Okay. Try this again. <laughs> There that? we go. Yep. Good. Beautiful. Okay. All right. So I'll just talk a little bit about the specific project that I did at the Institute last summer. Um, so here's just a cute picture of one of the turtles that we found. And so in the beginning of the project, we knew that there were box turtles at the Institute, but we didn't know much else about them. So our goal was to kind of find them, be able to track them, like Jen said, and figure out what parts of the Institute they're using, what's important to them, and then also to be able to protect their nests. So we did a lot of visual searches in the beginning where we would just walk through the woods and look for turtles, which was kind of tough. Um, and we found a few that way. And then we also had a team of turtle dogs come in. And so these dogs are specially trained to find turtles by smell. And so box turtles in particular can be kind of hard to just see when you're walking through the woods. Their pattern actually makes them blend in really well with dead leaves and stuff on the ground. And so these dogs are really helpful because they could find them just by how they smell. And so they came to the Institute for a couple of days and they helped us find a couple of extra turtles, which was really fun. And so after we found each turtle, like Jen mentioned, we would put a radio transmitter on its shell and we could use the antenna on the right that picks up the radio frequency that the transmitter emits. And that would allow us to easily find those turtles every day. So we could track their movements throughout the property and that was especially important during the nesting season because we could find the turtles at night when they were nesting. And so that was a huge part of our project, especially in the beginning of June. Um, we would follow each of our female turtles that had a transmitter on it, and we would check to see if she's nesting. So the picture on the left is, shows pretty obviously when a female is nesting, she'll dig a hole in the ground with her hind legs. And so if we saw one of our turtles doing that when we found her, we would watch her through the night. And so it could take up to a few hours sometimes. But once we saw her laying eggs, like you see on the right, and she filled in her hole and she left, we would go ahead and protect those nests with this nest exclosure. And so the nest is actually in the middle of this. You can't see it because it's underground. Um, but this exclosure protects it from things like raccoons that would normally dig it up. And so this gives those turtles a better chance of surviving and hatching. And so this was just kind of a funny situation. Um, there is a turtle nest here that we protected. And then later in the season, we went out and there was another turtle nesting right next to that. Um, so we had to figure out a different setup for how to protect that one. Um, but anyways, that was really successful. I think we protected eight nests overall, and we were able to get 25 baby box turtles out of that. And so these are just some of the pictures from one of the nests. Um, like we saw before, they're really small, really cute. And 
we let some of those go on the property. We just release them into the woods right on site. But the exciting part with this project was that we got to bring some of them to John Ball Zoo for the winter as well. And so they've been there for a couple of months and they've been growing really quickly. And hopefully we are gonna release them into the wild soon and be able to track them and see if holding them over the winter gives them a better chance of surviving into this, into the rest of their lives. And so if that's successful, that will be a really good way for us to help turtle populations that are struggling. So, and that's just a really cute close up that one of my friends did. <laughs> um, so yeah, so that's what I had for that. Great, thanks Faith. Yeah, so that, that's pretty much, that was kind of it. That's kind of how I was gonna wrap it up too. So we've got these babies that are now, um, that's a, this is a common technique in conservation called head starting. And the idea is that you take animals that are tiny and normally have really high mortality and you kind of give them this boost um, in captivity for a couple months. So these turtles will come out after a few months in, at the zoo about the size of two or three year old turtle, turtles we're guessing. So hopefully they'll have a better chance of survival and that'll help to boost the population numbers at the Institute. So, so that's kind of it. That's, so we, I see lots of questions binging up in the chat box. So we can, I'll throw it back to you, Ellen. And yeah, <laughs> definitely, you know. sorry. Um, so <laughs> no, one okay. question that came from the beginning, um, was does the DNA confirm phylogeny? Allison was asking that. Yes, that's a really good question. Yeah, so there, that's, um, that phylogeny that I showed is, is based on, I don't remember which markers, but yes, it's based on DNA. Um, and there are, uh, there has been a lot of debate, I will say, over the relationships amongst turtles um, over the years. So that phylogeny has changed quite a bit and it's still changing, but that's a good question. Uh, another question Fritz had, uh, how far does a box turtle roam in a day? So did he ask a baby box turtle in particular? Because I saw that one. Uh, let's unmute Or you, was it a And you can ask the question yourself. Fritz, I am unmuting you if you would like to be unmuted. An adult uh, box turtle. Well, we, we can include the baby box turtle too. I'm sure that's much smaller uh, distance that it goes in a day. Yeah. Yes, it is. And we actually did um, on another project up north in Manistee National Forest, we did put radio transmitters on the babies also. And I can tell you that they do not move very far at all in a day. <laughs> um, Faith, how far do you think your turtles at the Institute, the adults moved in a day? Uh, I mean, it really varied between turtles. We had one where we could find it underneath the same tree almost every day that we tried. And there were some <laughs> that would be like on the property one day and then not even on the property the next. So I think it really depends on the turtle and the time of the year. And the weather conditions too, right? Sometimes you'll notice, especially during nesting, if we get like a day like today, warm and rainy, the turtles are on the move. Mm -hmm. And then if it's dry and hot, they kind of just won't move that much. All right, it looks like Lindsay has a question. Do you want to just ask your question? I unmuted you. I think I did. Oops, no, I did not. Give there, me there, I got it. Okay. Lyndon, Lyndon, you can ask. What do turtles smell like? <laughs> what do they smell like? Oh my gosh, that's such a good question. I think he's referencing the dogs and being able to smell them out. Oh, that's Is such that a good question. <laughs> <laughs> that's an awesome question. So. I, I'll say that not all turtles smell the same, but they all have some kind of smell. And do you know how, how dogs can smell things better than we can, right? So dogs are able to smell things that we can't smell. So the dogs can smell, even the box turtles, which to us, the box turtles don't really smell like much. Sometimes they kind of smell stinky if they eat something gross, you will sort of like, ooh you must have eaten a rotten mushroom or something. Sometimes they kind of smell stinky. But most of the time the box turtles don't smell like much, but the, the dogs can smell them. So they must have some kind of smell that the dogs can smell. But other turtles like snapping turtles smell really bad. <laughs> they smell like mud and muck 
and algae and things like rotten. So if you've ever um, picked up a snapping turtle or helped it cross the road, you're familiar with that smell. <laughs> That's a very good question. So I know Kelsey also had a question. Uh, I'm gonna try to unmute you, Kelsey, if you wanna be. Oh, I think I am. Um, I was just wondering if you could give a little bit more detail on kind of what habitat you would expect to kind of find these guys in, or if you know we're doing field work and um, there's potential impacts to the area, like what we can look for to make sure it's not potential habitat. Yeah, definitely. Um, so they really like kind of oak dominated hardwood forests. Um, that's sort of what we tend to, to find them in. Um, and they like oak savannas to nest in, they like prairies, that kind of thing. So, but most of the time they will spend their time in primarily oak dominated hardwood forests um, that are near water as well. Usually if there's some kind of water feature nearby, that's important. So whether that's riparian along a, a river or, um, you know, next to some kind of water feature, that's sort of perfect habitat for them. Um, and then of course the females will need some kind of open canopy um, area to nest in. So that's a really good question. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Cool. We had one other question and then we're going to go to breakout rooms. Let me see if I can find you, Lindsay, to unmute you. I just saw a quick question about the dogs. What yeah. type of dogs? I'll right. just quickly answer that. They're Boykin Spaniels that he uses, which it's a hunting dog, I think. <laughs> with good noses. <laughs> One thing that came up in ours that I was going to ask Faith if she could tell us, um, the, the gals in mine, we talked a little bit about naming turtles because they had named some of their turtles and I was hoping you could share some of the names of the turtles at the Institute. Yeah, so we decided to go with a fruit theme for all of our turtles and so we had some like peaches and pear, um, watermelon, I mean, we had like 15 different ones. So papaya, all the one, the common fruits you can think of. Um, so that was kind of fun <laughs> coming up with this. Nice. There's some Any, nut, oops, go ahead. There's some nuts in there too, right? Oh yeah, so <laughs> when we found Blanding's turtles, we went for the nut theme. So we had, uh, what were the peanut and Oh, that's the one I remember right now. But yeah, <laughs> we, we had a food theme for the summer. That's for sure. Right. I have a question that we didn't quite get to in our breakout. I wondered if someone could touch a little bit on um, hibernation. And I think Jennifer mentioned that box turtles are very resilient and um, can withstand freezing temperatures. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, we talked about that in my, my breakout group too. That's a really good question. They're, they're, um, so the, the adult box turtles tend to um, be able to dig themselves down into the soil, maybe a foot or two down into the soil. So they can kind of stay away from those freezing temperatures. They sort of have a little buffer. And then of course, when there's a nice snow layer, that's also actually an insulator. So that keeps the soil a little bit warmer. Um, but the, the, the little hatchlings when they come out, right? So this sort of leads into another thing that we talk about in our breakout group. When the, when the, baby, the baby box turtles usually start hatching out about September. So September, October. So that leaves them really only maybe a month or two at most to find a place to spend the winter. And because they're so little, they can't really dig down into the soil that much. So they may only get a couple inches down into the soil and then they just have to sort of spend the rest of the winter there. So they, uh, we know this about box turtles as well as painted turtles. They have physiological mechanisms that allow them to um, basically freeze solid and then reanimate again in the spring. So it's pretty incredible. Um, some of our frogs can do this too. And um, it's, it's really an incredible adaptation to be able to deal with temperatures like they have to deal with in the winter in Michigan. So. I like to think of it like antifreeze in a way. It's in basically, <laughs> yep, that's basically what it is. Yep, yep. Cool. Some of the painted turtles, uh, don't they go down into the 
the bottom of the lake or pond? They do, yeah, yeah. So our pond turtles, uh, the ones that actually, yeah, most of the turtles that spend more time in water, they go down to the bottom of lakes and, and such to overwinter. Snapping they, turtles will do that too. Slowing their uh, metabolism down to almost nothing. That's right. And then another thing that they, that turtles do that everyone, that people find interesting is they're able to, well, we call it butt breathing. So they're, <laughs> they're able to actually breathe across the tissues of their cloaca, which is like their butt. So that's how they, they sort of can breathe a little bit when they're in the bottom of the lake over winter. <laughs> uh, thank you guys for coming. Um, and that's all we've got today. So bye. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you.